let's go. Break it down, put it there, bring it on, step it up, right there, break it down, put it there, here we go, step it up, bring it on, let's go. Uh. Those at home, because we're live streaming this lecture. When you're watching online, if you have any questions for our speaker or about something else, you can use the chat function on YouTube or the comments section on Facebook. And my colleagues are present to make sure we will be able to address them as much as possible in this program. But back to the program. It is now, yep, 12.43, time to start. These days, our lives are driven by deadlines, schedules, and timetables. Of course, time itself also has its own history. When did time start? Our guest of today will take you on a journey through time where the fascinating fields of astronomy, astrology, mathematics, politics, agriculture, superstition, and religion all come together. And it's now, I guess, 12.44. Please give a warm welcome for our guest, here in, at home also, for Dr. Donna Carroll. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. So, yeah, thank you, David. Um, so my name's Donna, and I work at Maastricht University in the south of the Netherlands. But from my accent, you can probably tell that I'm from the UK, and actually I live in Belgium at the moment. So, despite this international complexity, when I was invited to be here on the 16th of September at 12.40, I knew exactly what time and date to arrive here, uh, even though I had to cross a border. And the fact that you guys are sat here today, and our viewers at home have tuned in at the right time, that shows that you understood what that meant as well. And of course, you're sat there thinking, well, of course, why wouldn't you understand that, right? Because we have this universal understanding of time these days. But it hasn't always been like that, right? So there was a time when every village or city would have its own clock, and the time on that clock was uh, set due to the position of the sun in the sky. So you could travel from east to west between different cities, and actually the time would be slightly different in different places. But it didn't matter, because you couldn't travel that quickly and that far anyway. So nobody really noticed these things. Also, the days of the month weren't designated as they are now. They would be named after like local saints or local festivities that happened. And even the years were designated after the, the current ruler, so how many years into the reign of a, a certain emperor or a certain king. So as you traveled around, we didn't have a universal understanding of time. But we do now, and that's what I want to talk about in the coming half hour or so. And to do so, I want to take you back to the times that you might not be aware of this, but there was a time before wristwatches and iPhones. Uh, and so I'm going to take you back to the days of ancient man and talk about how they they were aware of the passage of time. And actually, uh, you know, of, of course, if you want to know uh, how time is passing, then you, what you want to do is observe what's happening in the cycle, the natural cycles in nature around us. And, you know, the passage of the sun across the sky uh, and the, the passage of day and night and day and night, that's a very clear cycle to everybody. So I'm not really going to talk about where uh, the concept of days and nights come from. But if you were to look at what the next most influential natural cycle is in our passage of time, that would actually be uh, the, the lunation, so the cycle of the moon phases, which takes approximately 29 and a half days. So this is this um, waxing and waning of the moon that gave us our monthly divisions of time. The word month comes from the word moon, same in Dutch, right, man and manned, so they're related to each other. Uh, and this was heavily influential in cultures, you know, before we had uh, street lighting, before we had all of the light pollution that we have today, then actually uh, the phases of the moon uh, played a big impact on people's lives. It was something that was really noticeable, and people even um, adjusted their lives around it, because in, in the days before street lighting, you would get extra light, essentially, at night, right? Right, which is why you have lunar societies in the past that had their meetings when uh, the, the moon was full because it gave them that extra bit of uh, light in the night time. And if you go back, you see all of the, I guess we could call them primitive calendars, but the first calendars were all based around this lunar cycle. And there's evidence you can see in uh, bone notchings or people dug um, ditches and these would kind of designate how many days there are in this uh, period of lunations. So they're the first kind of 
yeah, measures of time or calendar systems that you see arising. What we can also see, especially if we live in this part of the world, right, we see that the seasons are changing. So um, instead of months, we can kind of get an idea of years, the passage of a year. Uh, so you see that the seasons are changing, but this is really difficult to measure accurately, right? Today, it's going to get to like 28, 30, 30 degrees. So it's really hot, but a couple of weeks ago, like the highs were only 18 degrees. So you can't just use like how you feel in terms of temperature to get a good measure of this, what we call the tropical year. So instead, well, this is where the ancient Egyptians had a huge advantage, right? Because uh, in Egypt, the banks of the river Nile would flood over at quite a regular, so at quite the same time every year, right? So this is something that they could use to get an indication or a measurement of the length of a tropical year. And they even built these devices that uh, I think the name's really cool. They were called Nileometers, right? Uh, to measure the height of the River Nile. And they kind of, they, they were kind of like a well, uh, and, and you can see what the, what's happening to the water level throughout the year. So this gave them an indication of how many days there were in a tropical year. Other ways of doing this, uh, you can instead look at the position of the sun uh, as it appears to move across the, the sky from our perspective here on Earth. And, uh, you know, there are many famous structures that they believe were built in order to make these observations. Because we know that um, the, because of the tilt of the Earth relative to the sun, that it appears that as the sun passes, so this is facing south, as the sun passes across the sky east to west, the position of the sun and how high it gets in the sky will change throughout the year. So if you wanted to measure a year, you could either look at how the position of the midday or the noon sun changes throughout the year and wait for it to come back round, and then you know that a year has passed, or you could look at the position where it rises or sets, and that would give you an indication of what we call a solar year. So that was a different way of measuring it. And in fact, people take these really nice photographs these days. Um, so you kind of need fancy sun filters to do this, but if you were to take a photograph of the midday sun, um, you could do this like every couple of weeks throughout a year, you would see that the position of the midday sun is also changing throughout the year and you get this nice pattern that's called an analemma and yeah, we, we go around a full cycle in a year. Uh, and it, this, this is moving, yeah, because of our tilt uh, with respect to the sun. Uh, but also, yeah, it's going to get more complicated, but actually the lengths of the days are, are not the same as we go through the year either. So this is why we get this horizontal movement here. Now, if you wanted to try this experiment for yourself and you don't want to buy fancy sun filters, you can do this with shadows. So you can like stick a stick in the ground and look at the position uh, like where the, the shadow falls at noon and make a mark of that and then in a couple of weeks take, take that same measurement. So these are kind of nice experiments you could do at home. You can even do it by like sticking a sticker on your window if the window gets the noon sun and seeing where the shadow falls in your house. So these are kind of nice observations. So that gives us an indication of solar year. But we can also observe what's happening with the constellations, right? So you can look at the position of the stars in the sky, and you also notice that, yeah, like after one year, all of these constellations will have slowly drifted around until you're in the same place. So this also gives us an idea of the length of the year. This is known as a sidereal year. So actually, all these cycles that I've talked about, I started by talking about the monthly cycle, right, based, based on the lunations, based on the, the phases of the moon. That gives us an idea of, um, yeah, of lunar periods, and we've talked about the length of the year. Now, there are still like about 40 different calendars in existence at the moment, and they're all based on these cycles, right? So you get purely lunar-based calendars, but you also get these ones that try and follow the solar year, because for agricultural society, a year is more interesting than the months because you want to know when to sow seed and when to harvest and things like that. But people really like this idea of months being based on the, the phases of the moon. So you get certain calendars that kind of try and fudge the two things together. So your, month, your monthly cycles based on the, the moon, and then your tropical year based on the movement or the apparent movement of the sun, right? Um, the problem is, is that you don't, like, they, they don't fit quite well together, right? So it's actually more than 12 lunations or 12 months 
based on the moon cycle that fit into a year. So trying to develop calendars has also has been horrendously complicated through time. So what I want to talk about is how we develop the calendar system that we use today. Um, I mean, there are plenty of calendars out there. In fact, this one's my favorite one as we approach Christmas. I mean, it's 30 degrees today, and I'm still excited about Christmas. Never mind. Um, but yeah, so there's loads that I could talk about, but I'm going to stick to our civil calendar. And our civil calendar can be traced back to times of the Romans, right? So um, the first, the legendary first king of Rome, it was in this period that, um, that the first civil calendar was being made. And what Romulus decided to do was create a, a lunar solar calendar. So he was trying to have months based on the moon cycle and then get it to fit um, the, the solar cycle, right? So the, the tropical year. So he, he was trying to amalgamate the two. And he did this really weird thing, right? Um, Romans kind of revered the number 10. It's, you know, we know we've got 10 fingers, right? So it's useful for counting. So they counted a lot in tens. Uh, they split the Senate into 10 divisions and the military into 10 divisions, those kind of things. So he did this really weird thing where he went, okay, we're going to make a year and we're going to make it 10 months long. And the months were sort of based around, loosely around the, the moon cycle. So they were about 30 to 31 days. Um, but when you do this, it doesn't add up. We know how long a year is, right? And this 10-month cycle doesn't add up to a full year. So what he had to do was then go, okay, you've just got these extra days, which we tag on the end of the months, the 10 months. We've got our extra days. They don't belong to a specific month, um, but together they all make up the year. So these are called intercalary days, and they happened in winter. So if you look at what his calendar looked like, um, he had his months, his 10 months here, and his year began in March, named after Mars, the Roman god of war. Uh, I, I guess he chose that period because, you know, it's the start of the spring, it's when life begins, so it was a good time to, to have the new year. And here he had his 10 months. These first four are named after Roman uh, gods and goddesses. And I don't know what, really what happened, whether he just ran out of names. Um, but then after you get to the fifth month, you can see that the rest of the months are named after the, the number of the month. So you've got these Latin prefixes, quint, which means five, sex, which means six, etc. So we didn't have the months of January and February, which is why if you've ever wondered, well, oct means eight, and yet October is not the eighth month. This is because this is how our calendar originated, just with these 10 months. And as I say, at the end, you just kind of had these winter days that were sort of tacked on the end there, didn't belong to anything. They were perceived as being unlucky, so they didn't name them, because by naming them, it would be like more unlucky. So we'll just tack those on the end there. Um, and then along came the second king of Rome. And I said that the Romans revered the number 10, so they liked that. But they also thought that odd numbers were lucky. So he decided to reform the calendar, and he went, right, we're going to take all of the months that were 30 days, we're going to make them 29 days, right? Because 29 is lucky. But then the months are all shorter, so you've got even more leftover days. So what can you do with your leftover days? Well, you can make more months, right? So this is where the two new months came in, which were January and February. Um, and again, February only had 28 days. Again, it's even, right? So it was the unlucky month, and that's when you had to uh, make sacrifices and, and those kind of things. Um, so he implemented this 12-month calendar for the first time. And again, it didn't quite add up to a full year. So, in, you know, you still had this, uh, this, these extra days. So what he did, you know, these days we have a leap year system where we add uh, one day every four years. Well, they had a, a leap month system. So basically they would collect up their little bits of, like, days that didn't fit, and every few years they would add an extra month. So this is what his calendar looked like. He took these winter days, and he, he decided to start his year then in January. So we have our January and February. That's what he added. And the one that's in green here, Mercedonius, was the intercalary month. You didn't have it every year. You would just add it every now and then to keep your months in line with, with the seasons so that your year was aligned, basically. It comes from the word uh, mercies, the Latin word mercies, which like the word mercenary. It means wages. So people got paid in this month. 
Um, Numa did something else as well, and he designated how the days of the month were called. So I thought, ah, oh, you know, it's like interesting to have a look at what a Roman calendar looks like. Um, and if you do that, like if you have a little Google and you have a look at what calendars look like back then, um, they're really hard to understand because they didn't have a seven-day week like we have now. Uh, so they have the months across the top, and then they just kind of list the days. And to explain how they counted the month, I thought that I would uh, superimpose a Roman calendar calendar onto this month so that you can see what it looked like. So they started, the first day of the month was named the Kalends of the month, that's where the word calendar comes from, and came from the word to mean to call, because you didn't have a written calendar, somebody would, would read out to you uh, what the, the important dates were uh, for that period. So that coincided with the date of the new moon, because they were based on, loosely on the moon cycles. So this would be the Kalends of September, this is the Kalends of October. Then they had the Ides. You've probably heard of the Ides of, of March. Um, the Ides, that comes from the word to divide. So in the long months, that would be on the 15th. and uh, the short months, it would be on the 13th. And it coincided with the date of the, uh, of the full moon. And then uh, you had the Knowns, which was sort of halfway between this. Actually, the word Knowns uh, comes from the, the, the Latin prefix uh, nine, the number nine, the same as the word November, yeah, that also meant number nine, um, because Romans did this weird thing where they counted inclusively and backwards from things, right? So um, if you count inclusively and backwards from the Ides, you get number nine on the knowns because they go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and that gives you the knowns. Then uh, they named the day before all of these dates, because they counted backwards, they named them pre-dia, so the day before. So this is the day before the Kalends of October, this is the day before the Ides of September, this is the day before the Knowns of September. And the rest of the days they filled in with numbers, and the numbers all counted backwards and inclusive. So this date here is actually the third day back from the Kalends of October, if you include the Kalends. So it's one, two, three, right? So that's what that gives you. The third Kaland of October, they count it relative to October. This would then be the fourth. So you can start filling these in very quickly. Uh, and again, here you would count one, two, this would be the third of the Ides of September, et cetera, et cetera. So this is what the calendar would look like for, um, for September. And today's date, we say the 16th of September. Coincidentally, it's also the 16th calendar of October. So this is a really weird system, right? But this caused a lot of chaos in further calendar reforms because, like, you know, I've already said, oh, people played with the calendar a bit. They kept changing the number of days in the months, right? So this, this is a problem because if you decide to take, a, like, add an extra day to September or take one away in future calendar reforms, well, if I took a day away from September, because I count relative to October, today, the 16th calend of October would fall yesterday if I removed the day, if I changed the length. So when future calendar reforms took place, people, if they celebrated something, so say if today was the emperor's birthday, so it was going to be a big festivity, so that takes place on the 16th calend of October. Well, if I reform the calendar, would I celebrate it on the 16th calend of October, which would then be there, or would I celebrate it on the 16th of September relative to, to the position of the days in the month? I know this is confusing, and actually people at this time were also really confused. They didn't know when to celebrate, so often they just celebrated twice. So, um, so yeah, it, it, you can see like the kind of chaos that was arising at this time. I, it wasn't so chaotic because, as I say, people read the calendar out. They didn't have a paper calendar at home, so people didn't really know unless the day was important. Um, you can see also I said that they didn't have the seven-day work week, so they just kind of listed all the days under the name of the month. Uh, what they did have was they labelled the days from A to H, 
And that was like an A to H cycle. And it was like a market cycle, so an eight-day market cycle. So in your village, if, uh, if you had a market on one day, then the market would return eight days later. So that's what they had. And if there was a date that was important because it was a festivity, a feast day, it would be highlighted in red. And that's where we get the term red letter day. So that's what his calendar looked like. Um, but I said he also introduced this thing, right, Mercedonius, this month where people got paid, uh, and it was also an intercalary month, so you didn't have it all the time. This created problems as well, because you know, people didn't want to pay out money all of the time, and people might have wanted to keep certain politicians in office for longer, so it would be great if you could add extra intercalary months. So people messed with this month quite a lot. Instead of actually like, paying attention to the seasons, they just manipulated it for their own political reasons or financial reasons. And what you found many years later, so we're now in the time of Julius Caesar, the year had shifted out of alignment. So originally, like, March was supposed to be springtime, right? And by the time we get to 45, 46 BC, actually, in March was taking place, it, it was winter during that period, so everything had slipped out of alignment. And Julius Caesar decided to reform the calendar to fix this, to get March back in the period of the, the spring equinox. So what he did is, uh, in... 46 BC, he decided to add an extra 80 days into the year, so you've got this massive long year called the Year of Confusion, and that basically brought the calendar back into alignment. Um, so, yeah, and he was then the one who came up with this leap year system. Instead of having the intercalary month, um, he made the year into the 365 days that, that it should be, um, but then he added a leap year every four years so that it would, it would um, be aligned with the seasons. This was really accurate for its time, but actually it's 11 minutes too long per year. That sounds like nothing, but over hundreds of years, this makes a big difference. So I'm going to come back to that. So this is what his calendar looked like. He had uh, got rid of Mercedonius, introduced the leap day. March was taking place in the spring like it's supposed to. And the Senate was so happy that they renamed Quintilius Julius, and that's where we get the month of July from. So uh, that's July. Only two years later, he was, actually, uh, he was actually killed, right? And I don't know if the pontiffs were just not listening during the meeting, but they got the, after he died, they got the leap year system wrong, and instead of having a leap day every four years, they decided to have one every three years, and that meant that by the time we get to Augustus, a few years later, 40 years later, um, the, cal the calendar was slipping out of alignment again, and he had to come along and fix things. So he corrected the mistakes that were made. He did this over a 16-year period, and uh, they were so happy with his reforms that they renamed uh, Sextilius, they renamed Augustus. So you, this is where we get the month of August. And where Julius, the month of July, had 31 days, well, you know, Emperor Augustus, he, he, couldn't, he, could, he couldn't be outdone by Julius Caesar, so he had to have 31 days as well. And that's why we have July and August back to back with 31 days. So... Um, that's Augustus. And now we're getting a bit more into the future, so we're now talking about in, in the 300s. Constantine was the first Christian emperor, and he decided to make his own changes, right? He decided to implement the seven-day week. Um, it wasn't his idea, right? He stole this idea from the Babylonians, um, but he was the first to go, okay, that's what we're going to use for our calendar. So we know what the days of the week are, but where did they come from? Well, they came from the Babylonians, who, who were really good astronomers, right? So they did a lot of astronomical observations, and what they noticed was there were certain celestial objects that kind of moved differently to the rest of the, the constellations in the background, right? And uh, the, the Greek name for, for these is the, the Greek word for wanderers. We call them planets now. Uh, but they also included the moon and the sun because there were things that they, they didn't obey the, the rules of, of the rest of the sky. And what they did, you might think, okay, we've got seven planets, seven wanderers. That's how we named our seven days after, after them. But it wasn't as simple as this. No, they made it more complicated. What the Babylonians did was they listed these, these planets or these wanderers um, from length of the longest uh, orbit, 
uh, periodic orbit to the shortest. And then they didn't name the days of the week after them. No, no, no. They decided to name the hours after them. So they had their 24 hours that they had, and they got their seven planets, and they went, oh, let's name all the first seven uh, of the hours after the planets. Then I run out of planet names, and I have to start all over again, right? So then I add another seven and another seven. And then you get down here, and you go, hmm. 7 and 24 don't go into each other. So you go, okay, so then like, let's carry the rest over, and, uh, and then let's add more, and let's keep going until the cycle finally repeats. And that finally repeats seven days later, you get to the same, uh, you get to the same uh, pattern. So it was these first hours of every day which were known as the dominant planet, right? And that's where we got the name of the days of the weeks from, and that's what... Uh, Constantine decided to implement as our uh, day of the week system. Now, this is very easy to see in certain languages. Um, these, the other days of the week are easier to see in French because they've changed less. Um, because actually, once the Romans reached the rest of the world, so once they came up to, to, to Britain and Germany, um, we took on certain parts of the Roman system, but then we kind of wanted to give our own taste to it, right? So then a few of the days of the weeks were named after then um, either Germanic or Anglo-Saxon gods, and you can see where these come from here. Uh, and then, of course, as Christianity took hold, then in some languages as well, then Sunday was also renamed uh, in favor of uh, the Day of the Lord. Now, he did a lot of other things as the, as the first Christian emperor that I, I don't have enough time to go into detail about. But one of the things that he did was um, he was the first Christian emperor. I've said that already. And actually, there was, he was trying to establish Christianity as a standalone religion because the first Christians were Jews, right? And if you think about the most, uh, the most special festivity for, for Christians being Easter, well, Easter is based around, the, the date is based around uh, the resurrection of Christ, and that took place during the Jewish feast of Passover. So originally, Easter was dated based on the Jewish calendar, which is a lunar calendar, but that seems odd, right? If you want to be your own religion and you base your main feast day on the calendar of a different religion. So what he wanted to do, and he, he called a big council of bishops to decide, he wanted to create a date of Easter that would be based on the civil calendar that we were now using. So they had a big meeting, and they came up with a formula where Easter would be celebrated on the first Sunday after the first full moon on or after the spring equinox. It's complicated, but it's because Passover took place after the first full moon in the month of, uh, in, in the month of Nisan, the Jewish month of Nisan. So they decided to base it on this system instead of on the Jewish calendar. Um, but measuring the spring equinox is difficult. So instead of having to measure the spring equinox all of the time, they decided, OK, we'll measure the spring equinox this year, and we'll set that date as the spring equinox. And they set the date then for the 21st of March, because that's when uh, the spring equinox was taking place. Now, this is going to continue to be a, a problem, uh, and that's something that I'm going to come back to. But after the fall of Rome, we entered the Dark Ages, and, and time wasn't so important in this period, um, apart from in monasteries. And, and this guy, uh, Dionysius Exiguus, was tasked with keeping uh, these calculations for Easter. And he also came up with the AD and BC system that we use today, because he was using... Um, information from the scriptures that talked about where the constellations were in the sky when Jesus was born to try and calculate how many years ago that was. So he was the one who introduced these, these dates to us. But what I want to talk about very quickly is the problems that arise in, as you go through history um, with the, the two issues that we've talked about. Constantine fixed the date for Easter, but he was still using the Julian calendar that we said is 11 minutes too long. And what this meant was, if we go now hundreds of years into the future, so we're now talking about 1500s, so many, many years have passed, actually this is now a period where you have a printing press and where people have a paper calendar, what people were noticing was actually, if you take celestial observations, the spring equinox somehow wasn't taking place on the 21st of March. And if you've dated Easter based on the fact that the spring equinox is taking place on the 21st of March, it means that you're celebrating Easter at the wrong time, 
right? And, and maybe that doesn't sound like a big deal, but if you're eating when you're supposed to be fasting and you're celebrating on the wrong date, that's, that's like the wrong thing to do. And yeah, from other religions, they, this was becoming a bit of a mockery, especially if you look, in the 1500s, you've had the Reformation, right? So the Catholic Church were already having big problems at this point. So they wanted to reestablish their authority. And so Pope Gregory XIII came along, and he decided, OK, we need to reform the calendar all over again because we have this problem that Easter uh, is being taking place on the wrong date because of the calendar that is misaligned. Because when you take 11 minutes out per year over hundreds of years, this is starting to make a big difference. And in, 18, uh, in 1582, the calendar had slipped out of alignment so much that actually the spring equinox was taking place then uh, 10 days earlier. So what um, Pope Gregory XIII decided to do was actually remove 10 days from the, the calendar. And you can see here that uh, this is from November. The November the 4th goes directly to November the 15th. But this was also, it was a, move, a movement of the Counter-Reformation, right? So Catholic, this was a, a Catholic move. Um, and some countries thought, well, this is some sort of papist plot. We're, we're not going to do this. We're not going to mess with our calendar. So some countries took this idea on and some didn't. And in fact, in the Netherlands, where you had like the South that was Catholic and you had the rest that was Protestant, you had one country that did this in, in, in some parts and didn't do it in other parts. So you could travel from village to village and the dates would be changing. So, uh, and then, you know, even in the UK, where I'm from, they, they were uh, a Protestant country at the time. So they didn't take this on until nearly 200 years later. And Orthodox countries and Orthodox religions didn't even change this until the 1920s and still use uh, the old. Julian dates for celebrating certain uh, festivities. So if you're a historian, you really have to be careful, like, what do the dates really mean? Because what is our actual understanding? So he was the one who gave us the rules that we now use. So we still have this leap year system, like uh, Julius Caesar introduced, but it's not, e it's not every four years. It's every four years except on the centuries, except if those centuries are divisible by 400. So it's slightly complicated, but it's very, very accurate. And I'm a physicist, so I'm just going to have to put a graph in my presentation. But basically, this shows you this is the 21st of March, when the spring equinox was supposed to be. And these are the dates of the actual spring equinox, if you stuck to the Julian calendar. So you can see it shifting out of alignment, whereas in the system that we have today, it's kind of on average around the 21st of March. And all of this is horrendously complicated because at the beginning, I already said, we've got tropical years, we've got sidereal years. Actually, these things do not match up. And even those things are changing themselves because we've got this tilt on our planet and that tilt is wobbling slightly and our orbit is slowing down slightly and our orbit doesn't even cross the same path all of the time. It's crossing at different places and we travel, the Earth is traveling at different speeds in different parts of this orbit. So all of these things mean that our measurements for years and months and days actually aren't so fixed, and we want to fix it. We want it to be regular, right? So this is where the problems arise from. And you can see the same is true for a, for a month. So, oops, sorry. So months also, uh, you have two definitions for a month, and these things do not add up. So here you can see, uh, normally we talk about a month being from new moon to new moon, but you can also describe a month as being the moon traveling round on its orbit through, through 360 degrees. So um, these things don't add up. And a day is exactly the same. We have different definitions for a day. So if we're facing the sun at this point in position one, by the time we rotate 360 degrees, we've actually moved in our orbit to position two. So we're looking at the same stars, that we're looking at here, so that's known as a sidereal day. But actually, we have to tilt more than 360 degrees before we actually see the noon sun. So we've got two different measures of a day. Uh, and in fact, like I say, even uh, we travel at different speeds as we're further and, and uh, closer uh, from the sun. So this has an impact on the length of a day. 
So it's horrendously complicated, and I haven't even talked about smaller units of time, right? So, of course, we've talked about days, but it was the ancient, uh, the ancient um, Egyptians who then decided to split a day into 12 hours. Um, 12 is a convenient counting system as well. If you look at your fingers, you've got three sections on your fingers. You've got four of them, so you do three times four, you've got 12. That's a nice counting system. Um, but they used unequal hours because the length, of the, uh, the length of the days, as we know in this part of the world, change depending whether we're in winter or in summer. And that was completely normal. And they, they weren't interested in smaller units of time or equal hours. They were only interested in the proportion of the day that we had left. In fact, they looked at the shadows to determine what length of the day was left. And we get that length of time, we get that phrase from the fact that the length of the shadow is changing on these devices that were used to measure the proportions of the day throughout the year. So, yeah, when we come to modern clocks, uh, these, of course, it was astronomers who decided that we needed equal hours rather than these unequal hours because they wanted to be able to observe things taking place in the sky and the celestial objects. So they're the ones that gave us the 24 hours, and even early clocks actually had 24 hours on them rather than 12. But if you go back and look at the first clocks, they didn't even have dials because they only rang out with a bell what the hours were because people were only interested in the hours. Um, and in fact, we get the word clock from the German word glocke, which means bell, right? So it wasn't until more recently that we were interested in shorter divisions of time. Uh, and uh, I guess I'll finish by, because there are a few minutes left, um, talking about where are minutes from. Well, it's the fact that, you know, our clocks are based on a circle and Babylonians were already um, using the, the number 60 to divide circles or 360 degrees. It's from mathematical convention. Um, so that's where we get 60 from. And I guess... Uh, using our counting system where you have 12 on here. If you have 12 on your four fingers and you multiply them by one, two, three, four, five, you also end up with 60. So that's just a mathematical convention. Um, I guess minutes and seconds have now passed. I could talk more about uh, how we've in invented and improved our time measurement devices, but ironically, we are out of time. So I will call it a day there and uh, ask whether you have any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Donna Carroll. Thank you for your uh, vivid lecture. I really enjoyed it. And yeah, the year of confusion was, was a bit confusing sometimes, but we will all manage. Uh, first, uh, do we have any questions out of this audience? Just shout and I'll repeat it for the people at home. No question? Was it that confusion? Uh, I have a question, but it's more rather personally. How come you yourself are so fascinated by time? Yeah, I guess as, as, a, as a kid, I always liked to collect watches. So uh, watches always fascinated me. And if they were broken, I find it interesting to pull them apart. And um, I teach electronics. And one thing that I like to do is get my students to, to build digital clocks and things like that. And I got from uh, building digital clocks, I thought, oh, wouldn't it be nice to learn how to repair real mechanical uh, watches and things like that? Um, so I actually took a three-year uh, watchmaking course in yeah? Belgium <laughs> wow. uh, to learn how to repair watches and things like that. And I guess that the hobby just grew from there. And it's a really nice topic to use uh, in education. So I used to get students to like build water clocks and, and those kind of things, you need a good knowledge of physics to be able to do that. So. Okay, and you were telling me before the lecture tonight, you already have a Zoom a lecture yeah. for a watch company. Uh, not for a watch company, but a group of uh, watchmakers. Oh, yeah, watchmakers. Clock, clock so makers. you're sort of queen yeah. of the watchmakers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, do uh, uh, one question of mine. Who's your favorite uh, calendar reformer? Like Julius <laughs> August? Uh? I don't know, because it's... Uh, you know what I like? Instead of like just thinking about who reformed what, it's, it's this amalgamation of all these like superstitious reasons that we started with, and observations of celestial mechanics, and then political reasons, and then, you know, all of these things and developments in mathematics that have given us the time systems we have today. And, and I think that's why I appreciate the topic so much. And it's, yeah, like tonight I'm giving this talk for the, the watchmaking uh, group, 
And they deal with watching and watch repairs and clocks all of the time. But we never stop to think, well, why do we call Tuesday Tuesday? And why are there 60 minutes in an hour? So those are the things that we really take for granted. And I think it's nice to go, hang on, this has a long and complicated history. Yeah, <laughs> I know. And guys, do we have any questions from? Ah, OK. All questions are answered. Oh, OK. <laughs> uh, then for all the bachelor students, you can fill in the online form for the use regist registration now. You can find the link in the chat. Uh, the recording of this lecture can be seen again on our YouTube channel. And for now, I say time is running out. Time's up. Time's out. Thank you. And thank Dr. Donna Carroll. Thanks. Thank you very much. Oh yeah, uh, the, eerste, the first one's first out, so you have to wait a bit, but watch time.